the Coast Guard cut an eagle, the training ship at the, at the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. That was my first assignment. So here's two, two young kids from boot camp standing in the uh, administrative office. Uh, and the officer is saying, okay, we got two openings. So my assignment was at the Coast Guard Academy. And then there's different jobs within the Coast Guard Academy. So this officer says, well, he said, I got two jobs available. He says, one is the Bull Gang and one is down at the Eagle. So here's two kids that are just scared out of their wits. We didn't say anything. He says, I'll solve the problem. He says, I'm going to flip a coin. He says, okay, Rick, you're going to the Eagle. This kid, he's going to the Bull Gang, which was uh, the folks that moved chairs around, mowed lawns, and that kind of thing. So that's where I started out. Uh, uh, I spent a good part of my first four years in the Coast Guard on that ship, just over three years. The Eagle was built in 1936 by Blom and Voss in Hamburg, Germany. We acquired it as a war reparation in 1946. Other countries did the same thing, acquired ships that were built by the Germans because of war reparations. Uh, it's 295 feet long, the full mast, the main mast, they're 150 feet high. We generally worked in the air every day over 100 foot in the air. Wow. This mizzen mast, the last mast, is 134 foot. Um, yeah, it's just uh, quite the experience. I, uh, like I was telling your dad, I, I had five graduating classes pass through my hands that I trained. So by the time that I ended up my Coast Guard career 20 years later, these young folks that were just out of high school are now captains and admirals. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's, that's something. I There wasn't many places that I could go in the Coast Guard that I didn't know someone. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the persons ended up being the commandant of the Coast Guard, the number one guy. Uh, but anyway, uh, and while I was there, and, and, and this, here's a, the New Bedford connection, uh, the Eagle is, is what they call back rigged. That means that this aftermath, you've got this, this mizzen sail. Uh, New London, Connecticut is in relationship to Mystic Seaport. The curator of the Mystic Seaport Museum contacted the superintendent of the Coast Guard Academy and said, hey, we're redoing the Charles W. Morgan famous whaling ship out of New Bedford. Uh, they're re-rigging the whole thing, and it's also back rigged. Would you ask some of you guys if they want to come down and help us out re-rigging the ship? So here's the Charles Morgan out of my hometown. Uh, so I, I went and work on a Charles W. Morgan, and I rigged the Charles W. Morgan and some other ships at Mystic Seaport. And I'll show you, I'll show you what the Morgan looks like. I, The Charles W. Morgan should have stayed in New Bedford. And many years ago, uh, grammar school kids and and just the public school kids tried to raise money to keep it in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. They couldn't raise enough money. Mm -hmm. Mystic Seaport ended up with it. Mystic Seaport is not a whaling city like New Bedford ship really belongs in New Bedford, but yeah. anyway, at least it's being preserved. There it is. So it was kind of neat to be able to, and, and the other thing is, the fella that, that owned this, uh, Colonel, Colonel Green, um, had, had property adjacent, uh, to New Bedford in South Dartmouth. Um, I got married on the Colonel Green's estate, okay, which was another connection to this. 
and his mother was Hetty Green, and his, she's in the uh, Guinness Book of Records as being the richest woman in the world. Uh, he had plenty of money, uh, lived in New York City. Her son, the colonel, had an infection on his leg. She would go around the clinics in New York City to try and get free medical care. They knew who she was and she'd be dressed like a bag woman. And uh, they'd turn her away. Colonel lost his leg. Mm -hmm. She had mattresses full of money, okay? And this is this estate that I got married at was a summer cottage. Well, it's all marble. It was built back then for about twenty million dollars. Wow. Yeah, quite quite the place, yeah. but anyway. Uh but in all kind of records were set with the Morgan as far as, you know, uh oil that was brought in and that kind of thing. From from there, uh I ended up being home ported on another ship out of my hometown in New Bedford. And that was a two hundred and fifty five foot class uh uh what they call a weather cutter. And back then, before GPS and everything, ships would be stationed in a 200-mile square in the ocean all the way down the eastern seaboard and up the western seaboard of the country. We were monitoring. We, not, we did a lot of oceanography kind of work back then. Uh, we carried weather scientists, and the Coast Guard had oceanographers also. Uh, so we did a lot of that, but we also acted as kind of lighthouses or beacons for aircraft coming from overseas. And it was kind of neat. Uh, you sat out in this 200 mile square for 35 days until you got relieved. Uh, so planes were coming over from Europe. They would uh, they'd contact the ship. And they'd say, okay, this is flight, you know, 1472 uh, inbound in New York City to LaGuardia Airport or wherever it may be. The Coast Guard would come back and say, okay, you know, flight, whatever, we've got you on a course of this, you know, you're good, you know, inbound, uh, you know, to the States. And then they would, the, uh, Whoever's on the aircraft would say to any traffic going back to the States. It was kind of a neat little thing. Uh, uh, the radio men uh, would go ahead and say, okay, anybody wants to send a message back home and say, maybe if you're married, say, oh, I love you. See you in, a, see you in two weeks, honey. Uh, and and this, this aircraft, they would say, okay, they'd as much time as we had them on the radio, they would jot down these quick little one-liners, mm -hmm. they'd get back into the States, they'd get a bunch of penny postcards back then, which is, you know, doesn't exist <laughs> anymore, but, and they'd send one to your, your spouse, your girlfriend, or whatever, which was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and it was good for morale. Uh, uh, morale? Morale. Yeah. Morale. It? Not morale. 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 You're right. What is right. that? Morale? Yeah. Like well being, you know. Gotcha. Kind of feel good kinda of, mm -hmm. you know, you know. Uh so I was on that ship. The ship was brought back in the service uh just for a year. So I only did a year tour on, on that ship. In in uh they used to call it what they called ocean stations, and they were classified. So it might be uh, the one that the ones that I did were up north in the North Atlantic, real nasty, uh, cold, uh, just the worst of conditions it could be. Mm -hmm. That was Ocean Station Bravo. That was Ocean Station Charlie, and and right down the down the coast. Uh, uh, it, it was a it was a pretty neat experience. Uh, then I went on to being a lighthouse keeper. And I'll show you. I had one of the tallest lighthouses on the eastern seaboard. You can interject 
to ask you a question. That's my light. That's Boone Island Light. It's six miles straight out from the New Hampshire main border. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just sold uh, to a private party uh, two or three years ago now. Uh, when the Coast Guard said that's enough, uh, started doing away with lighthouses, uh, they burnt everything. All the lower part of the structure, and this is was where we lived in the house, they burnt. And then it was wood, got burned. All of this is granite, like three foot thick granite. Come Labor Day, I would have to plywood over these windows. I mean, this was not much of a rock. <laughs> and I mean, you just got pelted, uh, yeah. Now I have a question. Did any yeah. like family members like uh like did any of your family members also join like the military and did that like make you want to join the military? My dad that? was in the military. He was in the navy. Oh, he was? Yeah. 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 I know little about his career. Mhm. Mm uh, uh Yeah. It, it, I later found out uh he was the same specialty that I was. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was a boatswain mate. And a, and a boatswain mate is a person equivalent in the civilian world is a foreman. We manage people. We're, we're the jack of all trades mm -hmm. of everybody. Uh, we're the only specialty in the Coast Guard that can be in charge. Okay, so like when I had, uh, I was a uh, chief at the Frankfurt Station, I was the officer in charge. Boats are made as the only ones that, you know, no other specialty in a Coast Guard can be in charge of a Coast Guard station unless you're an officer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you're an officer, it's your address as commanding officer versus officer in charge. Uh, so, uh, and this. I was the officer in charge of this light, and it was kind of neat. This is this is what they call a four-man light, and the way this works, you're out. The tour of duty is normally a year. <clears throat> you would go out normally for two weeks, mm -hmm. and then you're off for one week, and it's called what they call compensatory leave. Anyone that's in the military gets 30 days annual leave per year. Compensatory leave does not count against that 30 days that's already there. It's besides that. that so that's nice. a good deal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you can accumulate it. So if if one of the, the other three people that were out here and they says, hey, can I stay and do two more weeks, stay out for a month, maybe they're single or whatever, or, mm -hmm. and they're playing a the game and they're doing everything that they, they should be doing as the officer in charge, they can say, okay, I'll let you do that. But anyway, the, normally the way the rotation worked is we had, we had fog horns out here and we had three generators to power the light. So you got to keep tabs on this equipment and check it all the time. Uh, and it was no kind of formal watch. It would be, okay, like I'm a night person. I'd say, okay, I'll I'll stay up till whatever time. I'll wake you up, you know, when I get tired. Or, you know, there was no, okay, I'll do four hours and then you do, you know, you just came to an agreement. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it'd be four people. Well, you had to have an engineering person plus an operational person, which would be like me. Um, so the first week, four of you were there. 
Then the next week, two of you go ashore. Then when they come back, the other two go ashore, and then it starts the cycle again. It's, it's a real good deal. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and like I say, you you usually do it for a, for a year, and that and that's what I did. Uh, then from near, where did I go? Okay. In between, half of my time, I either did on ships, or I was assigned to search and rescue stations, like the station at Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was at two search and rescue stations. After this, I went to uh, uh, South Portland, Maine, to a search and rescue station. Uh, and I did that probably for, an, for another year. And then I went to another search and rescue station back east, too, on Martha's Vineyard, uh, where I was the executive petty officer. Uh, and, and back then, unlike Frankfurt, and before, we were doing about a thousand search and rescue cases a year. So you can imagine, when most people are doing their, you know, recreation boating, it's on the weekends. Yeah. So we got a station that's got three boats. Uh, the weekends, we're just about passing each other with boats in tow. Uh, it's crazy. Can you okay. tell me a little bit about, like, huh? what you would do for search and rescues? Like, tell me a little bit about what you do for search and rescues. Well, the times have changed, mm -hmm. okay, but back then, someone might call in uh, needing assistance. It could, it could go from, you know, uh, maybe they're disorientated, uh, maybe they need the fuel, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they got a line fouled in their prop. Uh, and they needed to be towed in, uh, or they could be on fire, you know, a hot case where, you know, you better get moving. Yeah. Uh, so it, it can range the whole, from the least to, uh, and, and what happened, uh, now here I am, I'm on a vineyard, and, and we're covering uh, Vineyard Sound, Buzz's Bay, in the New Bedford area, as well as, you know, around Martha's Vineyard. So we could be towing, you know, we tow fishing boats back into New Bedford Harbor uh, uh, for whatever reason. Well, at some point, commercial salvages that, oh, wait a minute, you're taking out of our pocket money-wise. So now things start changing, the climate changes in the Coast Guard, whereas uh, you know, these, these salvages are in, in an uproar. Well, and they want the money in their pocket versus, you know, the Coast Guard going out and, and doing it mm -hmm. for nothing, uh, uh, just as a service. Uh, so that, that changed the whole climate and how we dealt with, with different cases. So if it was non-emergency, now it says, okay, well, what salvager do you want us to call for you? We'll make the call. Who do you want? You know, here's your options, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And pass it off to them. And then a watchstander is sitting in the station behind a radio and he's monitoring what's going on with this call. They don't even get on the way. So when I came to Frankfurt, Frankfurt was counting 100 search and rescue cases a year as compared to the 1,000 or 1,200 that I was doing back east. Mm -hmm. And there was probably 10 of those 100 cases that they had to get a boat on the way. That's on my Coast Guard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, How long were I, you at Frankfurt? Pardon me? How long were you at One Frankfurt? One year. One year. One year. 
uh, and it, it was things going on very similar to what happened uh, this this past year down in Frankfurt, uh, uh, where people from the district office came in and, and they had a little town meeting. And they said, "Okay, uh, we're going to make some changes in Frankfurt." I went through the same thing back in 1985. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not fair to the people. I was the last chief to have the full complement. I had 21 people when I had that station. We were a full blown out station. Mm -hmm. There was nothing in Manistee. In the winter there was two people in Manistee, you know, caretaker people, and then Manistee is what they call a summer stock program where in the summer and especially teachers that have a block of time in the summer they do all their reserve time in 30 days. That's that's who uh, that's where the personnel came from the Manistee station. They'd put a put a boat uh, there for the summer season, you know, just like Frankfurt is now, mm -hmm. Memorial Day to Labor Day, and that's all they had. And then once that was over, Labor Day, Frankfurt assumed Manistee's area responsibility. Okay, so whatever it is on the southern border of Manistee, out to the middle of Lake Michigan, and up to uh, West Bay is our area responsibility. It's, it was huge. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that that kind of changed. Manistee had a program called SOS, and it was Save Our Station. Okay, Frankfurt was the primary station, not Manistee. Mm -hmm. So now things, you know, they got some political pull behind them. They have a beautiful station there. It's what every Coast Guard search and rescue station should look like. They're not dependent on a marina to pull their boats out. They have all of that right there. It's just a beautiful station. Frankfurt now is nothing. Okay, I don't like what's happened at Frankfurt. I went to this last meeting to support the chief that was there. Uh, and like I say, I don't know the Coast Guard anymore. Mm -hmm. But I know enough and having been, you know, from a commercial fishing family, uh, uh, Coast Guard is pretty important, and I tell people that Coast Guard is a taxpayer's bargain for what what they do and the money that they do it with. It's unbelievable. So when I was at Frankfurt, here's a couple things that uh, the person that was over me, the group commander, uh, and, he, and he was down to uh, Muskegon at, at the time, he was not an operational type. He was not a boat operator or something. He was an administrative type. I'm an operational type. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I operate boats, I operate ships. And uh, so I get to the station and, uh, and it was like, hmm, well, don't worry about anything, Chief. Uh, you don't have to, eight o'clock, you can pretty much shut the station down. Well, that's not playing Coast Guard. Things don't happen that way. When there's something, <clears throat> when somebody needs help, it's not when it's the sun is nice and shiny and the seas are flat and, and all of that business. It's at the wor very worst moment. These people that I had under me, they're going to go on to other stations. Mm -hmm. I can't deprive them and, and shortchange them and not train them to go ahead, yeah. you know, and we were the most trained station when I had Frankfurt. Oh, uh, um. yep. Yeah. Uh, so they could go on to any other station and feel comfortable about doing their job. That's mm -hmm. how I do things. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, and when I was at Frankfurt, there's a competition that goes on every year. <clears throat> Frankfurt was a laughing stock of the group. They were the worst station in the group when I took over. Uh, I don't uh, I don't train for competitions. I train to do a job. Mm -hmm. So these young people say, oh, we need to, I just don't worry about competition. And, and we trained a lot. 
and realistically. Uh, and uh, first time I, I, I lived right at the station, that big house that's at the, yeah. when you come in the gate or to the right, that was my house. <clears throat> so I'd walk across the driveway, could be midnight. I'd say, okay, get on a boat, get suited up, get your helmets on, get your gear on, let's go. That boat had never gotten underway, right, until I showed up. <clears throat> and we're out, uh, and we had the 44-foot motor lifeboat. That's the boat that rolls over and comes back up in eight seconds. <clears throat> I'd take them out on that boat, and I'd say, I'm going to show you what this boat can do. And we'd try to roll it. <clears throat> and, uh, and the crowd's gathering at the public beach. They're saying, what the heck is the <laughs> Coast Guard doing, right? Mm -hmm. You know? It's a slow boat, but it gets the job done. <clears throat> and these guys, after that, then they would beg me to get get on the way, right? So anyway, so we we trained a lot. We won the we won the the uh, the trophy, and it's and I have it. They were going to throw the trophy away. It's a big loving cup. Uh, that was the last year they ever had the competition again. Never had it again. But anyway. Uh, part of my job and through my career, when I left Martha's Vineyard, that search and rescue station, I had made chief, uh, and I went on to uh, the district office in Boston, and I did it for three years, and I was what they called, <clears throat> my primary job was I was a district small boat manager, so any boat there was non-standard to the Coast Guard, I bought. I purchased, I researched the whole business. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was also what they call, as a collateral duty, I was what they call a pro tem inspector. I inspected all the Coast Guard stations from Canada to Rhode Island. So when I came to Frankfurt, and these, these folks are saying, oh, we need to, you know, worry about this trophy. Don't worry about the trophy. I was an inspector. Okay, <laughs> I've done. I know search and rescue stations like the back of my hand. Don't worry about. You know, concentrate on what you need to do to do the job. That'll all fall into place if you can do your job. Mm -hmm. And they did. So, anyway, and when I got here, I had uh, I had gone from Boston. Well, in Boston, uh, I there was tw 12 Coast Guard districts at the time. I'm not sure what there is anymore, if they've combined them or what. But anyway, uh, so Boston was, was the first Coast Guard district. Uh, I was nominated for the Douglas A. Monroe Award. It's the highest award that can be presented to an enlisted person in the Coast Guard. There's an, another award that covers the officer's side of the house called the, uh, I think that's the jo Jarvis Award, I believe. I'm, I'm not positive. But anyway, so there's only, in the whole Coast Guard, there are only 12 people that are up for this award. <clears throat> I didn't get it. No. I got. I was a second. But I like to tell people at one time in my career, I was in the top twelve enlisted people in the Coast Guard. Absolutely. There's yeah. forty thousand people in the Coast Guard. Okay. I'm also what they call a four O sailor. Okay. Every branch of the service is marked on three different things, leadership, proficiency, and whatever, right? The highest marks you can get a 4 all. That's what I had. I'm extremely, um, the girlfriend likes to say anal. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm real competitive, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just, I like to be the best, yeah. the best. Uh, so anyway, I left there, and then I went on to another ship. So half my time, I was either on a ship or I was at a at a shore station. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you a picture of this. 
and this ship has historical significance. That's it. That's the Storus. Uh, nickname is the Galloping Ghost of the Alaskan Coast. Uh, the historical significance is that and two other Coast Guard ships, uh, the Bramble and the Spar, made the Northwest Passage. Mm -hmm. So they went up from Alaska, they were out of Kodiak, Alaska. Went up through the ice field above Canada, down the eastern seaboard, through the Panama Canal, and back up the western coast. Wow. It has a nice break in hull. <clears throat> How long did that trip take? Pardon me? How long would that trip take? I don't know. No, no. It, it was done years ago, oh, before, gotcha. before my time. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a old newsreel of it, yeah, which was kind of neat. Uh, uh, on that ship, our primary duty was the enforcement of uh, fishing treaties with other countries. <laughs> so, U U.S., Japan, whoever wants to come fish in Alaskan waters. <clears throat> And it could be it could be in New England waters for that for that matter too. They agree and say, okay, we will not take this species of fish or crab. They take king crab out of Alaskan waters, hmm. they're in big trouble. Okay. <clears throat> so we took possession of three foreign fishing vessels while I was on that ship. It was a record. And what we do, I was putting a boat over the side with boarding teams, and and it doesn't matter the the way Japanese fisheries work. There's a mother ship that's a processing ship. It does everything. So you fillet a fish, flash freeze it, boom. The mother ship gets relieved, goes back to Japan. Those guys in the fishing boats, like my dad was mm -hmm. on, they stay out there for a year. They don't see their family for a year. Yeah. Okay, they're just fishermen, trying to make some money to keep their family fed. <clears throat> uh, and that's all they want to do, you know. Uh, so these, even after a fish is filleted, you can still tell what it is. So if it's cod, haddock, whatever. Uh, and like I say, they take they take king crab out of Alaskan waters. They, they're in big trouble. So what we do with these three fishing boats, we put what they call prize teams on board. We're armed. These fishermen don't want to, you know, they just want to be fishermen. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we get on board, get on the on the bridge where they're steering and all of that is, and say, okay, see that big white ship? Mm -hmm. Follow it. And they're going to do it. They don't want to, they don't want a problem. So here's, here's the stores and three other fishing boats all lined up. We're going back to Kodiak. And you got the Kodiak, you get them tied up to a pier. We put armed um, people on a pier. No one comes off them ships. Mm -hmm. And it's a real quick process. They'll go over to uh, Anchorage, usually is where they settle things up. Uh, so the, the Japanese, which was what we were dealing with, they just want to get back to fishing. They're losing money sending in Kodiak. So they get flown over to Anchorage, have their little day in court, and it's pretty much how much do you want us to fill in on a blank check? Mm -hmm. They pay their fine, and we say, okay, hey, have a nice day, you know, good fishing, see ya, and we're done with them. Okay, so 
also. Uh, how, yep. did, what kind of schooling did you have to do to go to the Coast Guard? What kind of schooling? Mm -hmm. Like, was it just training? School of hard knocks. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure that's changed too. Mm -hmm. High school education. Really? You know, mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, I'll tell you, you, you would be surprised, especially my first four years, uh, the number of people that had college degrees. You would just be floored. Uh, yeah. There's no dummies in the Coast Guard, I'll tell you yeah. that. You know, I mean, it's not the not the easiest branch to get into, and mm -hmm. I, I would I would bet it's the hardest branch, and that's just a guess. I would say it's probably the hardest. They're in probably the Air Force. I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not a not an easy branch to get into, uh, so you better have your ducks in a row. Uh, I was lucky. Uh, the draft was going on mm -hmm. the time that I entered, uh, and if my number had come up, Coast Guard would have said, "Okay, we'll we'll get you in pretty quick." Uh, there was out of there's a quota. <clears throat> uh, I was recruited out in New Bedford at the Customs House. Coast Guard had a quota how many people to bring in, and it was 12 people a month, mm -hmm. okay, which is nothing. Uh, eight of those were reservists of some sort, okay, so they might be a three-year reservist or whatever the case. There was only four regular Coast Guard like me that were coming in the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, four times 12 months, you know, not many people. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky. It, it seemed early in my career I served with a lot of young folks that were from fishing families, mm -hmm. whether they were lobstermen. My dad was a scalloper. Uh, we were all born and raised on the water. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've been on the, on the docks in New Bedford since I was four years old. Uh, so. Coast Guard was like, oh yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, I never left home, right? Uh, and didn't need much in the way of training, uh, well, you know. Would you say though, like, uh, so would you say you preferred working um, at a station or on a boat? Oh boy, you know, I get asked that a lot. What was my favorite station? They were all good. All good? They were all good. Uh, there, there were some bad moments, you know, uh, in my career. Uh, uh, I outlasted them, uh, or I outranked them. Uh, I, uh, I, like I say, this things that are impossible to do that I did in the Coast Guard today. Mm -hmm. Okay, that ship. Okay. So here it is. The guy says, okay, head down to the Eagle, Rick. All right. So you come out of, as the way the rank system is, going up going up that ladder, first you're a seaman recruit. Mm -hmm. They don't want to put, that's just one little, one little stripe deal. They don't even want to put that on your shirt in, in boot camp, okay? Automatically, they give you a seaman apprentice, which is two. That's what you're going to leave boot camp with, two little stripes. Mm -hmm. Six months later, you can add one more of them if you, you have to take a course, pass it. You get that third little, now you're a seaman, okay? Six months later, it switches from those little three deals to having what they call, is a bird, a crow they call it, and you know one one chevron that's a third class petty officer then two more second class petty officer then three more is first class petty officer so i went from seaman recruit to first class petty officer on that ship it's unheard of i was a first class petty officer in three and a half years a chief is 
okay, first first class is is it goes e, e, the first stripe E1, E2, E3, right up. So the first class is an E6. Mm -hmm. A chief is an E7. And there's three grades of chief. There's a chief, a senior chief, and a master chief. Okay, so the first chief is an E7, then an E8, and an E9. That's the topic, and then there's one, one other chief. It's Master Chief of the Coast Guard. There's only one of them, okay? I retired as a senior chief. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, middle of the line. I was the very next one to make master. Next one on the list. And there was some crazy things going on in the Coast Guard mm -hmm. at the time, uh, uh, but anyway. So that was kind of my goal, to be a master. I wasn't. I was one person off. But anyway, but most of my career, I was an E6, E7, or an E8, okay? Back when I went in, if you were had 17 years, that's about the time that you were going to make E7 chief. And you did that in so, three and a half? So here, here I am. I'm eligible. At three and a half years, I was an E6. I still had to have time in, as an E6 before I could take an E7 exam. But I took courses. I took two different courses because they renewed a, a course. And I said, oh, just so, sh so I don't shot change myself, I'll take it again and pass that a second time. <clears throat> now I'm going to compete with everybody in my specialty uh, that's looking for a job, you know, looking for that, you know, next step up. So I was first eligible to sit on a chief's exam I had four and a half years in a Coast Guard, okay, unheard of, okay, but the thing that would kill me, I didn't have time in grade as an E6, because you get points for that, uh, time in grade and time in service, I had neither one, right, mm -hmm. I didn't have any time, you know, so these other people that had 17 years that didn't want the responsibility that I wanted, that's when they would make chief, because they didn't want the responsibility, but they wanted the money in their retirement pay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the folks I competed with. So now, seven years later, okay, guess what? Little Ricky has got time in grade, mm -hmm. I got time in service. You son of a guns that are, you know, right? Yeah. That were, you know, kind of kicking me to the curb. Now, there's no one that can compete with me, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, I made Chief pretty pretty early on. I made E6 real early on, uh, and especially for my specialty. The only ones that would make that in that kind of time were specialists like electronics people, mm -hmm. really specialized fields. Okay, boats and mates were, huh, you know, if you want to be, you know, uh, uh, and his jokes about boats and mates, well, you know, uh, uh, you don't need to know anything to be a boat and well, it's a bunch of malarkey, uh, okay, anybody that can, that can manage people, which is what we are, uh, you're worth your weight in gold. I don't care if it's a civilian world. Or in the military world, if you can get somebody to do something and have a smile on their face, you're worth a lot of money. Okay, so yeah. And then the other thing that you know, I'm also a rigger. I'm a heavy equipment operator. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of falls under, you know, my specialty. To uh, and I love rigging. I love. Uh, you know, I could I could go ahead and uh, I could my truck out there. I could rig up enough block and tackle where I could have this young fella pick up that truck himself, and it'd be just wow. You know, <laughs> and I've done it with like scouting groups and stuff. Say, hey, is this take the smallest guy and say, hey, okay, give me enough tackle or like you know uh, you know big enough fulcrum, I'll lift this thing up. Right, no matter how big you are. So, yeah. Uh, 
And the thing with this store is, I played football on the Bering Sea. I served with two different captains. One was really a salty son of a gun. And uh, we would keep the ship just ahead in, in the ice enough. We'd put a ladder over the side. We'd go play football on the ice, which is pretty cool. You know? And one time, I had 43 people in my department. We put a note, we put a line right out the bow. We're all in orange, you know, uh, suits, <clears throat> uh, foul weather gear kind of, survival suits. I got 43 guys pulling on this line and we took a picture looking back at the ship like we were pulling the ship through <laughs> the ice. <laughs> so we did, we did some cool stuff. Uh, did you like make a lot of friends while you were at the Coast Guard? Oh yeah. You still in touch with them? I am. I am. I just had, uh, I had people come out here from Wyoming. Uh, I spent I spent 16 days and months in here recently. Mm -hmm. uh, these folks were planning on coming out. Uh, I've seen their kids grow up. Uh, they each just started a new job. Uh, they only had a week vacation. They said they were going to come out and visit. And they kind of knew what my situation was. And uh, I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, you come out here to visit me. Don't come out here to put me in the ground because I won't have it. Uh, and uh, I got out two days before they got here. They only spent two days, two two days with me, or two and a half days, uh, before they had to drive back to Wyoming. Uh, yeah, their, their family. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the thing, you know, I don't, I didn't know a lot about, about my dad. I wasn't real close to my dad. Uh, uh, my family disowned me, okay? I've got no, you know, I really don't have any family. So the Coast Guard has been my family. Uh, I don't know how many, uh, we went on an Alaskan cruise for the second time. We went with three other Coast Guard couples, uh, and it was more of a reunion. Mm -hmm. I've seen, you know, we, we traveled up the Inside Passage. Uh, I've traveled up numerous times. I don't go for a boat ride, and, and the guys, we were all stationed in Alaska at one time. We don't go for the boat ride. We go to eat. And renew our, you know, our, our friendships. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but all these people I've kept in touch with over the years. Uh, I've seen their kids since they were born uh, and grown up. Uh, you know, the, one other thing. You know, my last assignment was uh, on Governor's Island. Governor's Island was the biggest Coast Guard installation in the country. It doesn't exist any longer. It's right off the tip of Manhattan. I was a deputy chief of police. We had a, a population of about 6,000 people, and I think there was, I think there was 17 different individual commands there. Uh, well, I was there, uh, and I played a key role in the rededication of the Statue of Liberty. Okay, I ran a command center for 96 straight hours, non-stop. So I might nod off, and, but for 96 hours, I was running the command center. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, at the time, the largest peacetime law enforcement effort ever in this country, ever. I protected President Reagan and Francois Mitterrand, okay. During that time, uh, we, we, uh, we worked with the FBI, White House staff, every military special team, uh, you know, like sniper teams, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. it was on that island. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was unbelievable. And anyway, I took an explosive device out of the building, okay? So the way the island, island is, the tip of the island, Reagan and Mitterrand were going to shoot a laser beam across 
to Bedlow Island where the Statue of Liberty was and relight the statue. GE had done special lighting and lit, lit from the base right on up. So they were at this end of the island with the viewing stands and everything going on. The building that was adjacent, we got word that there was an explosive device in that building. Mm -hmm. uh, myself and another person went in and we took the explosive device out of that building. Uh, made national news. Wow. But that night on the national news in front of my police headquarters was a fellow and, and on the back of his jacket said FBI. That FBI agent had nothing to do with it. Okay, but anyway, so here I am. I'm so close to retirement. Mm -hmm. We go in the building. No one in this building knew what was going on. So we got this information. Okay, this device is going to be in this red duffel bag. It's this, sure as heck, is the red duffel bag. And we get into it and we start pulling stuff out. And, and I don't know what these rags were soaked in, uh, but they were soaked in something. And then next thing you know, here come the wires and here comes the device. So we, we got it out of the building. No one ever knew what happened. So you know. would you like, oh wait. Okay. So would you say, that, like, would you like to let other people who are thinking of going into the Coast Guard know about these things? About, like, what's in for them? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to the bathroom here. I'm going to answer. Yeah. Uh, to go in any branch of service. I would tell them this is what it did for me. Okay, this was the good, this was the bad. Okay, if someone went in the military and they're doing it three or four years initially, and they didn't even like it this much, mm -hmm. I'd say leave, get out. Okay, because you reach a critical point. If you get to the ten-year mark. Either go for it or don't go for it, meaning the 20. Okay? The benefits, I left when I was 39 years old. I was retired. Okay? The bad thing, I went through two marriages. The last one cost me half of my retirement. Okay? I've been divorced now for probably 23 years. Uh, she was married to me over 10 years, uh, and if she asked for it, which she did, she got half of my Coast Guard retirement. So in the last 23 years, this lefty woman got a quarter of a million dollars mm -hmm. from me, okay? Uh, God bless her. Because uh, she did me wrong. I uh, found herself a little boyfriend on the internet, but anyway, uh, you know, I believe in karma. It'll it'll come around, but it, anybody that does 20 years in a, any branch of the military, it's probably going to cost them a marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a it's not an easy game. Uh, the Coast Guard is probably the closest to having a civilian job as you possibly can have. Uh, yeah, I, I had no intention of staying, you know, but, I mean, by the time that I was in E3, one rank over a seaman, I was in charge. Mm -hmm. I was in charge of something, you know, E4, E5, E6, I was in charge of bigger things. I liked it, yeah. you know, uh, and I liked the responsibility. So, mm. how would you say that being part of the Coast Guard has changed you, like, or impacted your life, like, a lot? Boy, boy, oh boy. I know, it's a loaded question. <laughs> oh. And I don't know if it's a good thing. I'm really, uh attention to detail that I have, no matter what I do. 
Okay. Uh, uh, you learn responsibility and what it is to be responsible is probably a big thing because mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's there right now. I mean, I talk with people that own businesses now. They're looking for people. They can't find people that are going to be responsible, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so it's, yeah, uh, yeah, and it, I think this little stay in a hospital uh, uh, really gave me a lot of time to do some, do some thinking. But there was a lot of, a lot of young people that, that passed, you know, you know, had to deal with me and, and I said, wow, I really renewed my faith in young people. Because I've seen a lot of bombs lately, uh, and I really said, "Is this what we're going to leave?" You know, mm -hmm. and I apologized to at least two of them, and said, "I'm sorry for what my generation has done and left for you to correct." But I know, having talked with you, that you're going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. You're going to make it right. That's how I felt about these young people there. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, and and I and I tell and I told them I said, you know, and they were focused. They knew, okay, maybe I'm going to start as a a little aide, but I'm going on to this. They had goals, and I think all young people need to have that. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Are there like any important life lessons that you've learned from? your experience in the Coast Guard that you would like to give to the younger generation, possibly? Yeah. 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 And I think something you learn in the Coast Guard right from the start. A chief is, is the one that's kind of like that drill in sergeant, drill instructor, uh, whatever as compared to other services. It's a chief that's in charge of a company. Uh, and he'll tell you and told us right off, you know, you fall over the side, you're not looking at the color of someone's skin that's offering you a hand, okay? And I think the, the way I lead my life is by the golden rule. And I really think with these crazy times that we're in now uh, and not get political about anything, we need to look out for each other, you know, be neighborly mm -hmm. once again. Uh, and and that's, that's what I'm doing in Michigan. I've been in all 50 states, okay? I may have just passed through them, but I've been through all of them, okay? Hawaii, Alaska, every one of them. I took the girlfriend back east a number of years ago, which is where my family is. They're either in Maine or Massachusetts. And she said, well, she says, why won't you come back here? We've got some beautiful country back there. And I said, you know what? I says, I'll tell you why. Lucky enough to have been in all 50 states. Uh, here, the short time I was here in Frankfurt, uh, uh, and it says a lot about Midwest values. Uh, somebody gets in trouble around here. Let's have a spaghetti dinner for them. Let's help these folks out, whether you know them or not. Let's be do the neighborly thing and help these folks. They're part of our community. Okay, so I think that's what we need to be doing. You know, is just looking out for each other. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, and that's the way I try and live my life. And I and I, and I think if if everybody else did the same, I mean, you know, yeah. what, a, what a wonderful world it would be, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't regret having been in the Coast Guard uh, at all. I very seldom wear a, a military ball cap. Once in a while I do. And, and people, uh, boy, thank you for your service. I had a wonderful time, okay? I did, okay, I don't regret it, uh, you know, uh, early on, Vietnam going, uh, crazy times back then, mm -hmm. okay, we used to have to leave 
the ship in what they call dress canvas, a dress uniform. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're all suited up like little sailors, and and then we were down. I was on the Eagle, and we we had made a trip down to Portsmouth, Virginia. So neighboring Norfolk, big Navy community is next door. So a few buddies, we're going to go, we had time off, we're going to go to uh, uh, the beach and we left the ship going down the sidewalk and first people that came by spit on us. You know, that's, that's what was going on during Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It was just it's crazy times. Uh, you know, I've dealt with Black Panthers, I've done with all of that. Uh, you know, people that, uh, oh, you're a baby killer, you're this, you're that, and, okay, right, we're just doing what we're told to do, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, first time somebody s spit on me in uniform, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, boy, I thought everybody loved a sailor. Evidently not, you know, so, yeah, so it's crazy times, you know, so, and we got through it. Yep. All right, well. Thank you. Is there anything else you that didn't come up in this interview that you'd like to talk about? No, 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 no. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of sad. Uh, uh, I talk I talk with my son. He's up in up in Maine uh, this morning, and I let him know this was going on. And uh, I've got I've got four children of my own. Uh, only one of them has been out here in thirty years. Uh, not real close to my kids, my grandkids. Uh, it's it's really sad that uh, they know little of what their father has done. You know, I mean, uh, I would have loved to have my my grandson say, "Oh yeah, you know, my grandpa was a lighthouse keeper. I had a ghost on that light, by the way, too, and I experienced them." Uh, no, you know, most most lighthouses do have them, uh, but anyway, you, you know, so much that I could have said, hey, you know, you know, come over and sit with Granddad, uh, you know, uh, you know, and I'll tell you sea stories all mm -hmm. night long, uh, you know. So I I regret that. Uh, yep, yeah, my, my boy, the one I talked to this morning, he came out here. Uh, probably the best summer that I've ever had uh, and I had a house I lived on uh, Adams Road mm -hmm. okay and uh, so he, he came out and uh, uh, and I'm kind of a no-nonsense kind of guy and uh, so he comes out like to like to sleep till 11 o'clock in the morning which is fine and and uh, I picked him up at the uh, the airport in town got long hair and and I don't uh, I don't like to play the game without putting the rules up front okay I don't make them as I go along so we got his bags in the house and I took him out to my little wood shop and I said okay son of mine here's the rules and I said I know your your mother well enough that first thing she probably told you your dad's not gonna like your long hair I said that's baloney I said, the length of a man's hair isn't the cut of a man, okay? I said, you go ahead. That hair gets, you know, dirty and smelly. And I'll make it my business. Then wear your hair as long as you want to wear it. Just take care of it in my house. I said, I'm the adult in this house, not your mother. Right? And that's the game he was playing back back in Maine. And he was, and he was out raising hell with his buddies and did some serious stuff. So here he is, you know, a kid, you know, 14, 15 year old kid. And um, so one day, and it had to have been the hottest day of the summer, we had to we had to do some work in this yard and, well, he wants to sleep till 11. I want to get this stuff done before it gets hot. And, uh, and I got him up early and he just, boy, mattered in a hornet. And, um, so here we are, he's behind this shovel, I'm doing this, and and he said, oh, Daddy, I think you could do this better than I can. I said, oh, I said you think your dad just fell off a turnip truck? I said, you're doing real fine, son. <laughs> and, we'd, and we'd take breaks, we'd go down the Conway Road, jump in, 
in the lake, get cool, and come right back. And and um, and I tried to make things a lesson to him. And I said, you know, I said, I know about all the hell racing you've been doing. Because you don't do that in my house. Uh, and uh, but I says, you know, I, I says, are you enjoying yourself? And he kind of not swear, but he just you no. Know, I said, let me tell you something. I said, if you're really enjoying yourself, you go back to your mother in Maine. Keep pulling the baloney you've been pulling. You're going to be somebody's donkey the rest of your life. Start using this, okay? And evidently he did. Goes back. My former wife calls me, and my blood would just boil when she'd call. I don't know what you did to your son. I think, oh, here it comes, right? She says, it's not skipping school. You want to make him class president? He's on the automotive troubleshooting team. He went on to win a scholarship. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he's he's only one one of four people in the state of Maine that can work on on emergency vehicles like fire apparatus and that kind of thing. Okay, he just got back from a. A, another when well, he was in Vermont uh, so there's only four people in the state of Maine that, that are certified to do the work that he does he's got his own business second person is certified as his partner so there's only two other people so he's you know done done well for himself and, and unlike my father uh, my father knew exactly what I was doing in the Coast Guard uh, my father could never tell me he was proud of his son. He could tell his buddies, but he could never tell me. So I make sure when my son, I don't care about his business. I've owned businesses myself. Uh, I says, you know, I, I always make sure, and I think parents need to do this, you know, to, to challenge their kids and tell them, hey, when you're doing something right, hey, I'm proud of you, okay? And I'm not proud of my son because he owns a business. I'm proud of him because he's a good man. He's a good dad. He's a good father. He's a good husband. That's why I'm proud of him. Mm -hmm. That other stuff, you know, anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, thank you, Rick. Yep. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 it was fun. Yeah. Rick, I worked for you.